And let's begin if we can. So I want to first of all just step back two steps. Words matter. And when we're in the lunchroom with a colleague and we're discussing a patient or discussing a case vignette, looking for some collegial advice, and we use this phrase, treatment-resistant depression, what do we mean? The first point I want to bring up is that this moniker first appeared in our literature way back in 1974, 50 years ago to the year. First time it appeared, 1974. The World Health Organization had really coined this phrase. Now, in 50 years, one would have thought we would have had the time, that's a lot of time, to come up with a definition that is universally agreed upon, a definition that is validated, a definition that has a, maybe a biomarker, a definition that has some predictive utility, a definition that is routinely implemented. And we don't. What do I mean about predictive utility? My gentleman that I described, which was a real patient, real situation, is a great example. He was told he had TRD. That seems pretty doom and gloom to me. That seems very defeatist to me. That's very discouraging, not just to him, but his family, and I think all the, the circle of care. He didn't even have difficult to treat depression. And it turns out that his non-response adequately to SSRI, SNRI, variety of treatments, had no bearing on what he got next, which was ketamine, by the way, to treat his illness. He was receiving repeat infusions of IV racemic ketamine. Now, one might say, okay, what is the importance of having this definition? Well, there's many reasons why we need this definition. First of all is, it's so difficult to precisely estimate how common is treatment-resistant depression if we don't have a consensus definition. In the academic area, as we try to identify what are the risk factors, what are the preventative factors, what are the underlying mechanisms, how best can we treat this phenotype, we clearly need a consensus definition. 